I'm Antoinette Marie Johnson, and I'm the only thing standing between you and your lunch. This will be a little bit of an interactive uh, exercise. Um, I think that we're here today collectively to determine the future reputation of Philadelphia. I'm a branding professional, so I see everything through a branding lens. And I'm not quite sure if you know, but uh, the Brookings Institute has recently invested $300 million in the reputation of Philadelphia. They have determined, the largest global research institution in the world, that Philadelphia has a perception problem. <laughs> Is that news to anybody? <laughs> I think that the kid before me had it right. He, he's 18 years old and he already made it to the stage to say, fuck Tom Brady. <laughs> <laughs> and I'm here to tell you news that you might already know. Um, but no, it, it, they've determined that the perception problem globally in Philadelphia has actually costed us in the region a lot of money. We've been less able to attract talent and employers. We've lost money. Um, some would argue we've lost a bid, but you know there's a lot more to uh, celebrate. And I think today is about challenging everyone in this room. Let's imagine together, collectively, that we're a part of the group that's determining what to do with the $300 million. <laughs> we have a seat at the table and they're all looking at you. You know, this table, like the iconic cultural representation of Philadelphia, let's say, Rocky, the cheesesteak, booing Santa Claus, they're all over the age of like 52. Um, the table's new. So let's imagine that it might look a little bit more like this, or like this. You know, I have been joking that I feel like Solange's new album, A Seat at the Table, is my calling. And I think it's the same calling for a lot of the people who spoke today and a lot of the people who have mentored me. It's not that we're trying to replace the table. It's just that it's a new era where, like Solange, we may have been the funkier oddballs out. We may have been the more natural ones. We may have been the less pop culture, the less conservative, the less typical, and now we've been invited to have a voice. And that's what I think my talk is mostly centered on today, is if I, a branding professional in the room, have a superpower, which is definitely branding, which I think is the art of helping someone or some place or something reach their full potential, and if I were to enact part of that superpower today with you, how could I encourage you to have a seat at the table like these folks? And the agenda for us today is for us to help collectively determine what is the future representation, reputation of Philadelphia. What is the narrative? I, I'll tell you a personal story. Um, I currently actually live in New York. Uh, I split my time between Philadelphia and New York. I spent 16 years here, went to Temple University, um, was really moved by being what I felt at the time was like a privileged white girl living in North Philadelphia. And the, the environment I was surrounded by um, felt as if it needed my voice again at the table, um, that it didn't seem right to be at the College of Liberal Arts at Temple University be studying urban planning and development and be reading so much about third world development and then to be in North Philadelphia seeing its state of neglect. Um, to me, I felt a calling in my soul to uh, really double down and invest my future in Philadelphia, and I have. I've built a business around branding and specifically branding urban transformation. I'll show you some of our work, but um, a couple of months ago, you know, 15, 16 years later from that calling, um, I was called by the Philadelphia Business Journal to comment on the future state of Philadelphia's reputation with that new knowledge that the 300 million from the Brookings Institute was being invested in Philadelphia. 
And I was listed amongst a few people speaking on behalf of Philadelphia, saying um, all of the great potential that we have, the Commerce Department, PIDC, some really important people. And then my comments, Antoinette Marie Johnson, I'll remind you what my name is again, um, <laughs> landed the cover, and it was super negative. <laughs> I mean, uh, I, I try to be positive. You know, I have this exercise at work where if you could name all the negative things, let's put a line down the center of the board and name all the positives instead. Let's reaffirm what we would rather, what we would sometimes more naturally say in the negative, right? So I felt like I was a little bit misquoted when it said that Antoinette said to shut up about Rocky and cheesesteaks already. We've had enough. That's old news. I certainly did say that. <laughs> <laughs> but I think it was a little bit more like the paraphrase here, which was not quoted by me. But um, the groups charged with promoting the future state of Philadelphia the more modern version must first deal with the underlying perception issues. So it's not that we want to replace Rocky, because that's an amazing story of adversity that certainly Doug Peterson, a Super Bowl champ, uh, embodied in his culture with the Eagles last year or the many years that he coached there before coming back. It's not that we want to abandon that underdog mentality, but we certainly have a perception issue about ourselves. It's that we've for so long felt of ourselves as, frankly, losers. We developed this inferiority complex. And now that I live in New York, and by the way, I stay highly connected to Philadelphia, so much so that I've been asked to speak on the stage, and then my name's not pronounced right. <laughs> Chris is never going to live that down. Um, uh, living in New York, but staying highly invested in Philadelphia, the headquarters of our company is here and will stay here as we grow. But living in New York has taught me that, man, people in New York and LA, for instance, they scream really loudly about something that's not even as good in some cases as we've got it. So I feel a calling even more so to say, how do we work on this self-image problem? So this is our business, and we try to create a positive culture. We're called Cohere. Our main objective is to do what we do best, which is create cohesiveness amongst messaging or aesthetically. It doesn't mean that everything looks the same. It means that there's some cohesion some unification around shared values and goals. And I think everyone in this room, we could presume if they paid for a ticket or paid for a discounted ticket or were drug along by a friend or a speaker, um, you presumably agree that Philadelphia is great, that there is a lot to be thankful for here and that there's a lot to celebrate. So Cohere, our whole entire mission is about uncovering what that greatness is through our amazing skill set of design. So design is our tool, right? Design is what we do on a regular basis, and it's what helps create culture and showcase values that, again, presumably we all share. And if values are determining our future, I'd like to kind of paint for you how we use design. And then at the end, I have a couple of questions to see how we can pull out your superpower to also highlight some of the best things about Philadelphia. And maybe as a group, collectively exit this room with an agenda that's shared. So we have pledged our design skill set to a mission, which is to revitalize Philadelphia. We try to do that with spaces that you might recognize, the Scholson restaurants, Harp and Crown in this case, with spaces that were formerly abandoned or underutilized. So this is 1525 Sansom Street, which was formerly a factory uh, outlet store for Gap. So um, they moved that store and it, it, was, it was abandoned for 15 or 12 years. Um, and now it's a beautiful restaurant. We help conceptualize these spaces. 
Um, 990 Spring Bar Garden is a good example. So first one was restaurants. I think co collectively our group has branded and helped market 22 restaurants in the last uh, couple of years. This is 990 Spring Garden. This is a commercial office space that is now revitalized and is part of the spring arts movement where the new Kismet just opened. Versailles, this is a uh, Philadelphia landmark that was redeveloped. It's an apartment building. I'm not sure if you can see, but I chose some of the images, although we have a ton, um, and now we're doing projects in other cities, but um, I, I'm hoping you kind of see there's a commonality amongst our design ethos, which is to highlight and recreate and make new, but not lose the old. And so in the spirit of that, with redesigning Philadelphia's new reputation, I kind of wanted to talk about Hip City Veg, which I'm not sure if you know, but she has, I think, three locations in Philadelphia and is in expansion mode in DC. Um, they're all plant-based vegan fast food, and they have a cheesesteak that's all plant-based. Um, and I think it's a perfect example of the future being plant-forward. Uh, and so if we've pledged our design skill set to highlight and recreate what was, let's say, underutilized, abandoned, or old, what can this room work together on? So the question still remains, if we're here together as a unit, it's technically a democracy, um, and if you have a new seat at the table, let's ask ourselves some questions. So I'd love to hear from the audience now. Uh, since that article, I've been trying to think of ways that we could do the line down the middle of the page. And so instead of saying shut up about Rocky and the cheesesteak, on the right-hand side of that page would be shout out you know, the things that are new, different, better to highlight the future. Uh, how can we collectively retire the cheesesteak? For instance, I'll give you an example. There's um, the, the most popular article on Visit Philly's website, the most visited website for tourism to Philadelphia. I think they have 1.2 million visitors a year. The most commonly visited article on that website is top five places to eat your Philly cheesesteak. If there's a demand, right? If you're constantly asked the question when you won't go on vacation, do you know Zerpats? Or, you know, you say you're from the Philadelphia region, people go, oh, you must love cheesesteaks, right? How do we collectively retire that vernacular? Tax it. Tax it. <laughs> Urban farms, Reading Terminal Market, holes in the walls. I think one of the things I've been learning on a global food scale is that Stephen Starr is one heck of a respected entrepreneur, restaurateur, right? It's incredibly difficult to do 27 different concepts, let alone open 30 plus restaurants, a majority of which are located in Philadelphia. The Starr universe has spawned incredible restaurateurs who have become little entrepreneurs in Philadelphia. So what was the old BYOB is now the new super cool hotspot, um, and there's a plethora to highlight. So I think that the point of this question was about collectively retiring the cheesesteak narrative and refusing to give in to it. Um, it's a call to action to say, let's just not even answer the question. Let's talk about what else there is. And instead of giving in to the demand of cheesesteak being the theme, let's talk about something completely different. And because of time, I'm going to move on to the second question. So what is more valuable to highlight moving forward? The people. The people. The Yeah. What was that? The food and art scene. The art scene is so unique. The food scene, we've all agreed, is really unique. So how can we like highlight where they might merge together too? Walkability of our grid. Walkability, great one. Like, yeah, yeah. like the grid itself, the, the intrinsic design of it, we are more walkable than most cities. 
So I think the key to that, and wow, this group is amazing. See, we're gonna get paid $300 million to do this. <laughs> the whole point of the, these exercises was to say, let's retire the cultural icons and let's highlight the differentiators. So walkability is such a good one. Walkability and some of the best public transportation in, in the United States. So instead of giving into the you know, really old vernacular of movies that you know, aren't as relevant today or, um, or, or uh, something that hardly of us probably eat once per year, let alone all the time. Uh, let's highlight the differentiators. And the last one, how can your story be more influential than Rocky's? I think, honestly, it's, it's funny because I, I didn't think about taking this talk out there. I actually almost shut up myself when that Philadelphia Business Journal article came out. I got really worried that people were gonna see me as negative and how Philadelphian. Um, <laughs> I, I, I am inspired today by everyone else. Um, so I actually changed this number three to be how can we go out there and be the Rocky and, and, I'll, and I'll try and live that too and say, take it on the road, take it out there, be loud. Um, I know there's a few people in this audience that I know personally who have struggled with putting themselves out there. It's really tough. I don't know how that 18-year-old kid <laughs> did it. Um, but once you're here, like this is a great community to sit, tap you on your back and say, it's like really, really good job. Um, so shout out to you, Mike. And I think Marissa, who's in the audience, you guys encourage me. And um, amazing job, Chris Plant, creating a stage where it encourages everybody else. Grateful for you being here. And gratitude to Philadelphia. <laughs>